So the heart, the most important muscle, more important than the biceps, the chesticles. I mean, we got a ton of stuff going on here. And I'm sure people know that abusing PDs is not really good for the heart. And so let's see what kind of damage has been done. Um, am I screwed? Yes or no? Well, let's see. First thing we see is not green. So HDL dash p so let's get right into that yeah so uh, in general you're not screwed your hdl is quite low it's pretty common so in general the more androgens you have and the less estrogens the lower your hdl will be so it's thought of as good cholesterol um, part of hdl is a particle known as apolipoprotein a1 which is a uh, protective hdl helps take cholesterol back from the vasculature to the liver for metabolism. So there's always a balance, just like muscle uh, protein accrual and breakdown. There's also a balance between cholesterol entering the bloodstream and leaving the bloodstream. So, and I, uh, oh, sorry, do you, sorry, did you have more? No, I was just going to say you're all, you're trying to do things to help your HDL, like eating salmon and presumably taking omega threes. Um, but sometimes people just run lower on HDL. And even if they're taking four grams of omega threes a day, it's still not going to be optimal. And with HDL, it's clearly related to the uh, PDs that I take. The more I take, the worse it is. I've seen it way worse than this when I'm on a cycle, but where I'm on HRT, it's not so bad. And I, I see 60 is like on the optimal, but what would be like considered like if I was just the average person here, what would be that range? Cause I'm at 28 and a half here. What would be, would it be about 30? Am I, how close am I to being like for normal people? Not optimal, but normal. Yeah. Technically normal for men is usually considered 40 and above. Normal for women is usually considered 50 and above. But really that's just because women have different hormones than men. So, you know, normal is probably just 50 and above. Um, that's one of the reasons why men might have more cardiovascular disease. When people are under 50 or 60, I usually have them look at their ratio of apolipoprotein A1 to apolipoprotein B. And yours is excellent. So... Um, I'm, I'm much less concerned than I would be if you had a poor A1 to B ratio. And so is, I mean, this is a bit above my head here, but APO A1, APO B, like I always tell people like HDL to LDL ratio, good versus bad cholesterol. Mine's actually pretty good. Although my good cholesterol, the HDL is a little on the lower side. I don't have a lot of the bad cholesterol. So is that overall indicative of like pretty healthy heart? What, what could you say to that? It can be loosely correlated. So uh, a lot of the evidence shows that the actual number of the lipid particle is not the strong predictor of cardiovascular disease. Inflammation, like even autoimmune disease or chronic infection, insulin resistance, um, that is more indicated. Think of that as the glue that causes the cholesterol particles to stick, um, which might make you more likely to have an unstable plaque. So um, I, it's loosely correlated. But what's probably going to happen in the future is people's lipids panel, lipid panel, if their LDL and HDL is a certain ratio, um, it will reflux or it will automatically order an apolipoprotein B to see if it is over 90. I, um, there's several, uh, there's a lot of talk about adding that to each lipid panel for people's uh, annual screening labs. And I think one of the reasons I, I say, you know, the cycles are so bad is whenever I've gotten my blood work done, the, my cholesterol has always been out of whack while on cycle. And then when I come off, I can go get my blood work done again. And it's like, hey, what the heck did you do? I'm like, I stopped taking trend. And the doctor's like, well, what do you mean? Like, they don't understand this stuff. But like, that's literally what it's done. Um, and I see my LDL. I see all green, the bad cholesterol. So maybe you could briefly touch on that. Yeah. As far as your LDL and your APOB, you know, it's quite low. I'm not concerned with it. Your lipoprotein A, which is kind of a specific lipid particle is a touch high. Um, if you're not at high risk of cardiovascular disease, you don't have to aggressively treat that to decrease. But, uh, all in all, I think your lipid parameters for someone on TRT look quite good. The slightly high LPA and the slightly low HDL are kind of picky things, but all in all, I think they look great. And so just if I'm like, well, I want to fix it. I just want to be perfect. I mean, I'm already exercising, I'm already eating healthy. It's just pretty much just like, well, there's not really much you can do aside from probably lowering the dose of your, your, your testosterone. Is that about it? 
Yeah. Um, the other things is adding in more healthy fats. So flax seed or hemp hearts, hemp seed, uh, that's some good sources of omega threes as well. A lot of people, and what I'd probably do if I was in your shoes, you know, desiring true health optimization from 98 to hundred percent would be take three to four grams of EPA and DHA. So they're, they're the two types of omega threes that are associated with decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. There's a couple of prescription medications that are omega-3 ethyl esters. Vesepa specifically is EPA only, and then they also have Lovaza, which is a combo, and a bunch of other ones. But it's basically the uh, ethyl esters of omega-3 that are refined from fish oil. And if you take three to four grams a day, it has a beneficial effect to prevent cardiovascular disease. Okay. So in your opinion, I mean, a lot of people say, hey, supplements is not so great. Get it from the fish. You know, is it... In your opinion, supplement just as good as getting it from food sources? For the cholesterol, yes. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to keep track of every single micronutrient. So fish is going to have a lot of other things in it that are beneficial other than just the omega-3 content. And so those recommendations to supplement would be in addition to the salmon and flax that you're already eating to do that on top of it just to be like, you know, optimal. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, Probably the main thing that I wanted to talk about with your cardiovascular uh, health labs is your high sensitive, high sensitivity CRP or your C-reactive protein. So yes. your body has all these different, um, you know, different acute phase reactants, and they're a marker of inflammation. Again, whether it's infection or whether it's autoimmune disease, they can be very elevated, and uh, you know things like Crohn's. Um, if you have a an active infection like pneumonia, it can also be elevated. So yours was 1.6 between one and three is considered average risk of cardiovascular disease under one is considered low risk, but optimal range is less than 0.5. And this probably is something where the lower, the better. So, um, you know, you're not above three, but you are 1.6. Uh, you could consider, and you know, some of that might just be exercising harder than last time. Um, that can, you know, have a little bit of an effect on your liver. It can increase muscle protein, you know, break muscle breakdown as well, but it can also increase inflammation just a bit. So and as far um, as inflammation and whatnot, because I have an autoimmune disease, which is why I am, I have a hearing aid and I also have been tested for Crohn's and colitis because they do feel like I have it. Even the doctor yesterday said, I think you have it. They want me to do barium enema and so on. So I do feel like it's probably somewhat likely. Also, I kind of had a little bit of worry that perhaps this is related to some kind of a colon cancer or polyps, precancerous problems going in the body. I don't want to jinx myself, but like, does this indicate that perhaps something might be going on in my body? I don't think it's indicative of anything pathologic. A lot of times a cutoff of five or 10 is used if we're looking for autoimmune disease. So the reference range changes. So considering that, um, you know, your medical history, 1.6 isn't actually too bad. Um, I'd still recommend considering things like L-carnitine, which can decrease it or ubiquinol, which is a potent antioxidant or resveratrol, which is another potent antioxidant and garlic, which can also help decrease it. Okay, perfect. Well, definitely consider those. And do we have anything more in this? Oh, we, okay. Moving on. We see coagulation. What can yeah. we, I mean, I have, I have no idea what this one's about. So I'll let you take over coagulation. So coagulation has to do with the ability of your blood to clot. So the first one on your result list was fibrinogen. Fibrinogen, interestingly, is an acute phase reactant as well. Similarly uh, to the CRP or the ferritin or your platelets. Um, your fibrinogen was a touch high, which might be related to, um, you know, a little bit level of inflammation. It's also produced by the liver. So fibrinogen converts to fibrin and fibrin, think of it as the kind of a sticky uh, fibrous material that help the platelets clot. So um, if your fibrinogen is elevated over a long period of time, perhaps you're at a uh, you know, theoretically, it could have more, uh, you know, vector to help clot, um, lots of material to clot, but, um, it, you know, you're at kind of at the upper limit of normal. I wouldn't be concerned about this other than wanting to recheck it, taking a vitamin E supplement or having more vitamin E in the diet 
can uh, help your liver be more healthy and produce less. Interesting, because all I remember is from biology, coagulation, we all know what that is, but to make it a health marker, I just never considered that that could be something of importance. But I see at the bottom, colon cancer screening. Due to your age, it's recommend you do a colonoscopy. So we just discussed that. Yeah. I literally... It was the sixth time I asked for it and I can't get it. And it literally, I'm supposed to pick up at the doctor some kind of test where I can scoop some poop and they're going to test that. That was the best I could try to, to get. But it, literally, I get this done and it e even says I should have colon cancer screening, which is this, my sister and the whole thing. And so, is this fecal test going to help out? It will help out, but it won't detect any precancer. So I'm not sure what tests they order. There's several. There's a hemocult blood test that basically just looks for blood. There's a high, you know, false positive rate, in which case they would do a colonoscopy. The FIT test is the fecal immunochemical test. So usually you do that every year. There's several different tiers of recommendations in the United States. Um, the brilliant statisticians essentially looked at how many people uh, we need to screen to benefit and how many people we need to screen to harm. So for those 45 plus or with another indication, such as yourself, um, the FIT test and the colonoscopy are the highest tier. And then after that is Cologuard and um, you know other tests like sigmoidoscopy. So FIT test technically is on the same tier, but um, for someone that's in your shoes, I mean, <laughs> I would definitely want a colonoscopy and I would consider it superior to a fit test in your case. Yeah, and unfortunately it's not even the fit test. They, I asked them specifically and <laughs> so no. So I gotta switch the topics because I just get too upset about this stuff. Yep. And so metabolics and insulin resistance and so on, I seen uh, one nod in the green, a little bit concerning and I should just come you know, full circle here and say I ate breakfast before the test. Does that in fact impact anything? It was probably 700 calories, not a small breakfast. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, I was supposed to eat breakfast. And so uh, what do you think? Am that I healthy, impact is glucose. good or bad? It shouldn't in in impact your hemoglobin A1C. So um, all in all, your metabolic parameters look great. It looks like your diet is working. Um, your insulin is quite low, um, you know, hard to say if it's, too low because insulin can help with anabolism as well. There's a, you know, there's a reason why bodybuilders take insulin because it helps push glucose into the cells, but you're definitely not insulin resistant. Your A1C was 5.6 pre-diabetes technically starts around 5.7 and then ends at 6.4. So your A1C is a little bit on the high end. That's a type of hemoglobin or a, you know, a particle part of your red blood cell that has uh, sugar attached to it. So there is certain diets that are called uh, low glycosylated end product diets. And you can think of certain things that tend to glycosylate, even if they have the same amount of carbs or sugar, for example, chips, crackers, and cookies. So in other words, all the foods that I'm already not eating, <laughs> I should cut yeah. those out. So Correct. based on this, what could I, me do? Is more cardio going to help? Should I eat five meals a day instead of three? eight meals a day? Should I go on a keto diet? Like what? Is there anything I can do? Or it's like literally you're at 5.6, 5.7 is starting to be bad. You're already, doing, you, you're doing the best you can. Yeah. I would likely not do anything. If your insulin starts to creep down, you might want to check a pro insulin to insulin ratio. See how your uh, islet cells or your pancreatic endocrine cells are functioning because they're the ones uh, specifically the beta cells, they convert pro insulin to insulin. And it's possible that your insulin is very low, but your pro insulin is pretty high. Um, it is surprising that your insulin was still so low after eating breakfast. So perhaps that could be a test that would be beneficial. Some people that tend to have more autoimmune conditions are at risk of uh, something like a lot of like a type 1.5 diabetes, which I don't think that you're at risk for. And even if you were, it looks like you're kind of staving it off with lifestyle. But if you had a really high pro insulin and really low insulin, then we would be concerned with uh, you know, your ability to synthesize insulin endogenously. Some people have used like cerebral lysin or like theoretically, I'm, I'm a fan of nootropics as well, but there's a lot of different uh, nootropics or medications in other countries which are derived from uh, pork. And theoretically, there's some degree of concern with increasing the uh, autoimmune dysregulation of your pancreas, if you take those. 
Okay, and uh, when I go on diets and I get my body fat too low, like I'm fine at 9%. If I get under eight, I start, I can go hypoglycemic. I can feel like garbage. It's just, there's nothing I can do. Could that be related to this in, in, in any way? You're saying basically my insulin is so low. And if so, could I, or would other bodybuilders trying to like maximize or leverage everything, would they just be on insulin and just be like, hey, I'm just gonna use insulin, I'm gonna grow? It would probably be the opposite. If you're getting hypoglycemic, then your insulin seems like it would be too high. So uh, perhaps you're just extremely insulin sensitive, which does seem like the most likely uh, you know, outcome because you exercise harder than last time all the time and you're always riding your bike. You're probably just extremely insulin sensitive. Think of it as you know, the, average, the average North American is very insulin resistant and you're the opposite of that. So in That's other words, assessment. it's literally healthier to be like I am than, well, than the opposite. Yeah. Um, you know, you can make the argument that, uh, the, the thrifty genotype hypothesis, uh, which is where it was good to hold on to a bunch of body fat and not exercise too much hundreds of years ago when food was very scarce. Our culture these days, fortunately is a, uh, very resource rich environment. So, uh, having metabolic parameters similar to you does seem beneficial in today's age. And so because I've exercised for so many years and whatnot, that could have uh, helped me in some way. Do you think that like, you know, based on like a set point theory, maybe people want to live and, and be at a certain body fat percentage. Maybe you're born to kind of be 20%. But if you keep doing cardio and exercise and eating healthy, could that set point be lowered so that you could kind of be like, I, I can maintain 10% and not feel like garbage anymore. Do you, do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, to some degree, I think that's definitely possible. Um, if someone's set point is high for a very long period of time, it could be very difficult for them to be happy and function normal. Like, you know, just have a, a normal day feeling normal at a very low body fat. So that's definitely, uh, something to consider, uh, someone in your case where you, for like 30 or 40 years, you've exercised, even since you were a kid, you might be very used to that set point. You know, you probably went through puberty and your body was more used to it as well. Even if you were eating lots of carbs. I would be interested to see what something like a, a CGM monitor, a, a glucose monitor, it, it can measure the, your blood sugar and your inter interstitial fluid. Um, Freestyle Libre is the name of one of them. It'd be interesting to see how low your glucose got when you were feeling hypoglycemic. Yeah. And w would that, I mean, I don't know, would that be the symbol? prick of the finger test and you put the thing in a machine like I tried like 20 years ago as a, you know just what what's this mean and I'd come up with the results and it'd be like five point something whatever I don't remember the results but is that what you're talking about here or something completely different the technology has gotten a lot better so it's almost like a sticker or a magnet that goes on uh, usually people put them on the back of their arm usually diabetics use them but for people who have hypoglycemia they're potentially beneficial usually the first week the reading of your inter interstitial blood glucose is a little bit lower than what it actually is in the bloodstream, but it does tell you, um, you know, a quantitative figure, which is relatively accurate. And, uh, you know, it, it could tell us more about how hypoglycemic you're getting it, you know, obviously we'd manage it differently if you were getting down into the thirties and forties, rather than if you were symptomatic when you're 60 or 70. Yeah, so interesting because I mean, I know I've dieted many times. I've been at the gym and then the sweats come over and you're cold and I'm feeling like, oh, this is a bit weird. But I mean, this only happens when I'm like, I'm in a pretty big calorie deficit. My body fat's getting really low and I essentially feel like shit every day of the week. There might be an hour in a day where I feel normal. And that's why I keep preaching to people like, you might see those amazing Gymshark models and you see the physique of your dreams. And I'm like, you might look amazing, but you might feel like shit. And I feel like shit. I would love to be 5% body fat. I would love it, but I feel like garbage. So I'm much more happy to be happy to be somewhere in the middle. So I, I, I really strongly suggest people like to have a goal and just to go halfway to that goal and then reassess. Because if you just think, yeah, I want to lose 50 pounds. I want to have an ab six pack. You might get there and you might be miserable. Yeah. I think that's a great message. Another thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize is regardless of what they do, even if they go on the most aggressive uh, supplement and PED regimen and diet and exercise regimen, um, depending on your genetics and depending on what you already have, you know, maybe for someone who's not gone through puberty yet, this might be different, but whatever you do, you're only going to get a little bit better. So, um, you know, maybe that's 10%, maybe it's 50%, but 
Um, you know, it, you're not going to change into somebody else. So having somebody else's athletic performance or physique as your goal is probably not the best thing to do. A better, a better goal would be, I want to become 20% better. You know, I want to lose, uh, you know, this amount of my body fat for my body. And I want to gain this amount of muscle for my body. That's realistic. And just to end the, 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 to address the haters, the mosquitoes in your professional opinion, looking at my blood work, does it look like I am lying about what I'm taking? And I mean, this, how long was this done ago? Two weeks, maybe like this was recent. I've done my blood work maybe six times this year. If I was taking tests and trend and doing different cycles and stuff, I think that my physique would change. I've been consistently in the very low one nineties for a very long time. And I was, I'll say 20 plus pounds of muscle bigger back when I was blasting on cycle back in my prime. And the fact that I'm on a lower dose of HRT at 120 milligrams of which I think I'm going to up, um, does it make sense that I can maintain this much muscle in comparison to like what other people, because most people are thinking, well, I don't believe it. Why do you have that much muscle? I don't. And I'm just thinking genetics. I'm lucky. I'm, I'm not trying to say I train harder than everyone and I just deserve it more. I'm just saying, hey, I got these great genetics, you know, above average. I was winning natural shows in my day and I got a pro card. So even without a lot of drugs, I still look like this. And I would argue that even if I was not on HRT, had never touched it in my life, I'd still have a pretty damn good body, even at 45 years of age. You know, people are gonna say you're bragging and whatnot. I'm just telling you the truth. I think that because of my genetic profile, never touched drugs, I'd probably still be close to 180 pounds of muscle at my age right now. Yeah, that's definitely true. So I would take this to the bank. Um, whatever you're endorsing that you're on, um, you know, it correlates perfectly. It's very congruent with your labs. So if I was in Las Vegas and someone was betting me that, you know, Greg is taking more than he was taking, I would absolutely take that bet. So, I mean, I can't wait to see the haters watch this and they're going to be like, no, he probably paid that doctor. Have we ever chatted, met? Do we know each other? No, we've never chatted and met. Uh, probably our closest uh, relation is I used your diet to, to lose 40 pounds. Cause you know what people are thinking? Oh, he paid this doctor off. He's going to do this cause he's video. And it's like, and I'm like, look, I, I talked to Derek. He said, Hey, let's set this up. Let's do your blood work. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I got the blood work. It was the, the stuff sent in the mail. This woman comes from an hour away, drives to my house. She's about 70 years old. Well, maybe she's 60 something. And she's doing my blood work and also did Allie. And we're going to go over that later, which is, that's going to be exciting. And send it in the mail and boom, I get the results to write up and it's amazing. I got all this great information. So I strongly recommend you guys or girls circles of the world. Y'all give this a try. Great interview it was uh, highly educational. It was an honor to have you on the show to talk about my blood work and hopefully this helps other people. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely be an honor to be on here. One last thing that I'll touch on is it appears that your HRT time travel is working. When we calculated your epigenetic age, it was 42 years old. So there you go. That means I'm younger than I look. I'm actually yeah. 42. Everyone I've been lying. I'm not 45, 42.